late. I'm taking, starting to take things for granted, okay? So you might have noticed your exams are graded. I think they were put in your box. Um, there seem to be a few of the exams up here. Um, so what I'm going to ask you is that if you have any questions or concerns about the exam, you should talk to the TA who's... Introduce yourself. <laughs> Um, so, because, you know, the, the days of faculty grading exams ended at about 50 or 60 students. Now there's 110 or something. We tend not to grade the exams. So, um, if you were to come to me, which a few students have, I'd have send you directly to him because he's the one that actually graded it. So, if there ends up being some problem that can't be resolved, <clears throat> then I'll intervene or get involved. But, you know, hopefully that won't be the case. So, try not to bombard him with... Um, you know, spurious attempts to get a point or two or something like that, it won't end up making any difference. Um, but you know, if you legitimately have a question or a concern about how something was graded, um, then that's, that's fine. I, I've encouraged him not to give a bunch of points to people um, unless there's legitimate reason to do so. so. You understand, some of grading is judgment. Like you might say, that shouldn't be worth five points. Well, that's not really your call, okay? Um, so things where you actually got the right answer, it was marked wrong. Have we posted the solution yet? I don't think so, right? Okay, we'll try to post the solution, that might help matters. Um, so, you know, certainly if you have uh, a concern or legitimate question, you should ask him, but try not to, you know, overwhelm him with um, questions if that's possible. So, there's a few miscellaneous um, exams still up here. There is homework five, very efficient, um, here that you can pick up after class. I threw up the schedule here. You can see that, <coughs> well, we have class today. That's kind of clear. Um, and we won't have class Tuesday, sorry, Wednesday or Thursday because I'm traveling. And we'll start again up on next Tuesday. So this is, today will be our last lecture really on linear algebra. And then, um, well, other than a MATLAB lecture next Wednesday. And then we'll start moving to systems of nonlinear algebraic equations instead of linear algebraic equations. And then the last three weeks or so will be differential equations building, I hope, um, on things that you've learned in your differential equation class. So now that I've taught the class, I actually wish I would have structured it differently because my assumption was you wouldn't know enough differential equations till the very end. But I wish I would have done linear algebra, differential equations, then statistics. Because anyway, I'll let you comment on that after the semester is over. But you, the class in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the past has been taught, people have already had differential equations so I could talk about it the first day. But now I feel like I'm squeezing it a little bit too, at the, too much at the end, and I think you could argue it's maybe the most important subject. So anyway, I think it'll be fine, but um, we'll see how it goes. Now the project. Um, my, so you know, there's a special, we have, we have a special grader who does all the MATLAB stuff, Jonathan. So um, we have the, first thing we have is the next written assignment, which I think is number six. It's our, it should be posted, at least I sent it. So that should be posted up there. Um, then MATLAB number two is ready. I don't think it's posted, but we'll try to post it in the next day or two. That's ready. So it's going to consist of two problems. One, um, solving linear algebraic equations, which um, you should be in pretty good position to do. And then one, it's a two-part problem, linear systems, linear equation systems, nonlinear equation systems. So you could, if you wanted to, in principle, you could probably start on the first part, but not the second, because we haven't covered that yet. But it's, it's up to you. I'm thinking you might get bored when I'm not here. That's, that's what I, wor I worry about. Okay. Um, okay, and then the projects. So I have three problems constructed now. Um, I sent them to Jonathan just to see if he thought, you know, just to get a reality check on them. I think they're fine. And in a day or two, we'll post those up there. And the way that's going to work is you're going to pick one of the three problems to do. Okay? And the problems are pretty generic. Like the first problem, statistics, it just says, here's a, here's a set of data. I explain where the data came from, and then I say, do some analysis of the data. So it's not going to be prescriptive where we tell you every single thing to do. Okay. Um, so anyway, I think, that'll, I think that'll work better than my original plan where everyone picks a topic. Um, you can pick a special topic if you want, like if there's a particular problem you want to solve. But so far, the people that have come to me with specific talk, topics have not necessarily been on target. <laughs> How do I say this nicely? So they've either been way too simple or they, one came with an interesting problem that didn't have anything to do with chemical engineering. Um, and so, 
Um, but certainly, you know, if there's some problem you would like to work on because there's something you've seen that in re you've research you've done or something like that, that's fine. You can certainly talk about it. But in case you don't have such a problem, you can pick one of the three. Okay, you to work in group of so four, four students turn in one report per group of four students, and I will actually grade those. All right. So any questions? Oh yeah, the average on the exam I think was a 75. That's much better than I normally do. Let me tell you something. Um, I once gave an exam where the average was 35. Okay. <laughs> I was loathed. All right. Um, but I'd say typically I tend to give exams that are 60, so I, t I intentionally tried to make it so that it wouldn't be, usually my exams aren't any harder, they're just long, they tend to be long, right? So I tried to make it, I was on target, I thought that's about what I wanted to see. Um, I don't like to give an exam where the average is 90 because then you make a few mistakes and you're below the average, right? You could argue having an exam where the average is 35 is demoralizing, so maybe I should avoid that as well. Um, but so I think, you know, generally I was pretty pleased with how people did. And um, it's, a, it's a good start. You see that we have another midterm. Geez, it's not, it's not that long. I'm not sure why I'm looking at the clock because that doesn't have a date. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, whatever the ninth is, that's like a couple weeks from now, right? And that, that'll be a cumulative exam. I'll talk more about it, but it's certainly going to focus on the algebraic system stuff. Okay. Um, right. It's going to focus on nonlinear and linear and nonlinear sets of equations. All right, so everyone's good. Everyone's up to speed. Everyone's happy. Uh, well, you can't get, you can't make everyone happy. All right, so we're going to talk today about um, eigenvalues. So, did you to cover? <coughs> sorry, I have allergies. Did you guys cover eigenvalues at all in your differential equation class? Did you cover eigenvalues anywhere in your lifetime? Okay. Sometimes they're called characteristic values, but um, so the, so how do I want to introduce this? Well, right now, or we've had, we've had an obsession with um, this problem, right? I think you can argue AX equals B, just keep going over it and over it. Um, so soon we're going to move to sets, systems of differential equations. Maybe I should write them as, well, I'll just write T as the independent variable. It doesn't have to be time, but, and they're going to look like this, okay? And so what we're going to learn when we cover this material is that the solution of this set of differential equations depends on properties, not surprisingly, of that matrix A, and the properties it depends on is so-called eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that matrix, okay? So you could argue that the material being discussed today is a prelude to when we start talking about linear differential equations, okay? So that's the, the background for this. Um, so this is how it's structured. So I'll try to explain to you what an eigenvalue and an eigenvector is. Um, there's basically three ca cases. It's like, basically it's going to be reduced to solving a polynomial. And as you know, a polynomial can have r real roots, can have complex roots. The roots might be distinct, which means they might be different from each other. They might be repeated, okay? So I've just called out three uh, cases here that cover pr pretty much all cases of practical interest. I still don't have a pointer because I remembered finally to put batteries in, but then I'm like, I don't have batteries in my office. So anyway, uh, back over here. Um, so the three cases are if you, if, if a problem has the so-called eigenvalues are real and distinct, so they're real, they're real numbers, but they're different from each other. They might be real but repeated. That's case three. Or they might be complex. That's case four. Okay. And then I'll talk about something that I'll have to get there for you to understand. It's called matrix diagonalization. It's very useful for solving systems of differential equations that look like this, as we'll learn. Okay. So this is the so-called eigenvalue problem. You have a matrix A here. It's a square, it has to be square, so it's n by n matrix. And what you want to do is solve this problem. This is called the eigenvalue problem. It's a, it's a vector equation, right? A is an n by n matrix, x is an n-dimensional column vector, lambda is a scalar, and you seek solutions for this equation. Solution means there's a matching x vector and lambda scalar that solves the equation. If you can find an x and lambda that solve that, the lambda is called the eigenvalue and the x is called the eigenvector. Okay. So these eigenvalues 
okay, of which the number of eigenvalues, as we'll learn, is, is the same as the dimension of the matrix. So if the, if the matrix is n by n, let's say 3 by 3, then you'll get three eigenvalues and three eigenvectors for that, okay? Then these eigenvalues, they can be real, they can be imaginary, they can be complex, they can be either distinct, they could be repeated. So it's like any other case where you're finding, you know, just think of the quadratic equation, for example, finding roots from the quadratic equation. Yeah, and the x-satisfying, these are called the eigenvectors. So finding the, um, I'll show you how to, f for problems of reasonable complexity at least, how to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So the bottom part of this is just nomenclature, just a bunch of terminology, okay? If someone says, what is the spectrum? They just mean, please tell me all the eigenvalues of your matrix A. All the eigenvalues of your matrix A is called the spectrum, okay? Just terminology. It's better than calling it all the eigenvalues of your matrix A, okay? Um, if you have a, <coughs> excuse me, um, complex eigenvalue like this. So J here is an index saying which eigenvalue you're talking about. It's not really critical. I is the imaginary number. Sometimes people use J as the imaginary number, but I'm using I. So right, an imaginary number has a real part and an imaginary part. So if I want to compute the absolute value of the eigenvalue, then I do the following. I take the real part and square it, and I take the imaginary part and square it, and I take the square root, and that's called the magnitude, right? That's, that's the two-norm. We'll call that the two-norm in a different context. Um, and the notation for that is, you know, absolute value of this thing. So this is how we compute it, okay? And if someone says, um, asks you what the spectral radius for your problem is, they're asking, what is which of your eigenvalues has the largest absolute value? So in other words, if you have 10 eigenvalues, you find the one that has the largest value of this quantity here called the absolute value, and that's called the spectral radius, okay? So we'll use these terms maybe occasionally. It's just meant to introduce terminology you might see. It's not, not a core issue of what we're talking about today, okay? All right, so here, here's, the, here's the main focus here, right? We're gonna solve this eigenvalue equation. So the idea is I give you a matrix A, and you have to give me back the lambdas and the x's that correspond to that, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay. So how do we solve it? Solve it like shown on the board, or at least conceptually, how shown, uh, shown on the slide, I should say. Okay, so we've got this equation, right? Ax equal lambda x. And so I'm going to bring the lambda x on the left-hand side, and hopefully you appreciate I can't subtract a and lambda because a, a is a matrix and lambda is a scalar, right? So to manipulate an equation like this, I have to multiply lambda times i, right? That way a is a matrix and i is a matrix <laughs> of the same dimension. So that equation now makes sense. So what I'm trying to do again is find um, solutions to that equation. That a minus lambda i is called the characteristic matrix, okay? And it ends up that <coughs> solutions to this so-called characteristic equation, if you will, exist only if the following is true, okay? So you remember when we had matrix problems that looked like this, right? So turn on the lights for a second. We had problems that looked like this, let's say, or let's make it easier. Ax equals zero, right? And, and we asked, when does, when does the solution exist to the equation? Well, obviously one solution is x equals zero, right? That's called the trivial solution. So you want, we ask ourselves, when do non-trivial exist, solutions exist? Non-trivial solutions exist only if this matrix A is rank deficient. You, you have to go back maybe. And if a matrix is rank deficient, that means its determinant is zero. Okay, so I'm using that idea here. So I'm saying, so I see this equation. It's, it's now like AX equals zero, except obviously A is different. It's A minus lambda I, but same idea. So I want to know when will there be solutions that are not trivial, which means x is not equal to zero. That's only true if the determinant of that matrix is zero. If you go back in the notes, you'll see the analogy. <coughs> okay, so I have this determinant of a minus lambda i, and all I've done here, may look a little cumbersome, is I form the matrix a minus lambda i. So, you know, to make it a little more clear here, that's not the greatest color, is it? It's like the same color as the board. Who came up with this? Um, tell me if you like this color. That's pretty, pretty upbeat color. It's, it's not so, 
It's not the same, it's just equally bad. Okay. All right, let's just go old school then. Um, so A minus lambda I, so let's just say that A is a two by two matrix, right? So it has these components like this. You want to subtract off lambda I. So I obviously is the identity matrix. If you multiply lambda and I, you just get lambdas where there were ones, right? For the identity matrix. And then this thing becomes Uh, right? And so in my um, never-ending zeal to make things completely general, all I've done is write this for a matrix of arbitrary size. That's what this is, just a matrix of any size. Okay, that's the two by two case. All right? So basically, it's easy to form A minus lambda I. You just write the matrix A and you subtract off lambda along the diagonal. That's all you got to do. Okay? And then you get that matrix. So, and now you're looking for solutions of that, determinants of that matrix that equals zero, okay? And that particular equation called determinant of lambda, you know, determinant equals zero, that's called the characteristic equation, okay? So as I'm about to show you, once you compute this thing, you, you understand, you know the A's. Those are the, co these are the elements of the matrix A. I gave you the matrix A, so you know these A elements A. You don't know the lambdas. And this thing is going to end up producing a polynomial in lambda, right? So, I mean, for example, if you want to take the determinant of this matrix, two by two matrix, it means you multiply this times this and subtract this times this. That's going to give you a quadratic in lambda, okay? What you're going to do is seek roots for that, and the roots are going to be the eigenvalues, okay? Um, obviously, the complexity of this calculation scales with the size of A. If, if A is two by two, it's trivial. If it's three by three or higher, you know, these roots may not be as easy to find, at least analytically. Um, Obviously, I'll teach you how to do it in MATLAB as well. Very easy to do. Okay. So you get the idea. When I solve this equation, we conclude that um, solutions exist only if that determines zero. That's the only time solutions other than x equals zero will exist. And then we find the determinant, find its roots, and those roots are called the eigenvalues. There'll be n of them. Okay. They might be real. They might be imaginary. They might be complex. They might be repeated. Just depends on the problem. Okay. And I'm going to show you three examples um, in a minute of doing it. So before I do that, just here's some properties of the eigenvalue. So if you know the eigenvalues of A, you know the eigenvalues of A transpose because they're the same. So in other words, a matrix and its transpose have the same eigenvalues. If you have a singular matrix, it has at least one zero eigenvalue. So if you were to find, remember what a singular matrix is, right? It's a matrix where it's a determinant. Um, <coughs> of A is zero. That's a singular matrix. That's different than the determinant of A minus lambda I being zero. Okay. It's rank deficient, has determinant of zero, all the things we talked about for a singular matrix. So if matrix is singular, you'll find a zero eigenvalue. If you know the eigenvalues of the matrix A to be lambda one, lambda two, and so on, the eigenvalues of A inverse are one over lambda one, one over lambda two, and so on. Okay. These sometimes are useful because, right, if you happen to have the eigenvalues of A in hand and you wanted, for some reason, to know the eigenvalues of A inverse, you wouldn't have to work to compute them. You could just get them from the eigenvalues of A directly. All right, let's say you have a, <coughs> either a diagonal matrix A or a triangular matrix A. You remember what diagonal matrices are, I hope? They only have non-zero elements along the diagonal. Triangular matrix means everything above the diagonal or below the diagonal is zero, all the elements. If you have a matrix like this, then the eigenvalues are just equal to the diagonal elements. So, if you had a problem that looked like a matrix A that looked like this, well, that's not a good start. Let's try this. Okay, that's a lower triangular matrix because everything above the diagonal is zero. The eigenvalues are one, two, and three. Just whatever's along the diagonal, okay? So it's a nice shortcut, obviously, especially if the matrix is big. Okay, some more terminology here. If someone asks you to compute the trace of your matrix or gives you the trace of the matrix, that means they take all the eigenvalues and add them together. All the eigenvalues added together is called the trace. 
All the eigenvalues multiplied together amazingly equals the determinant of the matrix. I won't prove that, but... So if, if, if you had all the eigenvalues in your hand and I told you find the determinant of the matrix A, you would just use this. You wouldn't compute them. You just multiply all your eigenvalues together and get the determinant. Okay? All right. So this is all nice, typical, right? I introduce this concept, talk about all its properties. So far we have no idea how to compute this thing. <laughs> okay. So maybe I'll be nice and let you, let you compute them. Or teach you how to compute them, maybe is a better word. Um, so this is the general procedure and then I'll go through three examples. So the first thing we're going to do is form that characteristic uh, matrix, find the determinant of it to get the characteristic equation, find the roots of that, and those will be the eigenvalues. There'll be n of them, okay? Then we need to find an eigenvector corresponding to each eigenvalue. So we have this equation here, right? A minus lambda x equals zero. So then what I'm going to do is for each eigenvalue, I'm going to substitute that particular eigenvalue where k is one of these eigenvalues here, right? One, two, three. Substitute that eigenvalue and then try to solve this equation for x. Okay? And that xk is the eigenvector that corresponds to that eigenvalue. So if I have five eigenvalues, I get to do this five times. Okay? Now it ends up these eigenvectors are not unique. Okay? They're unique up to a scalar multiple, which means if you give me an eigenvector, and it's a legitimate one, meaning it solves this equation. I can multiply your eigenvector by any constant. It'll also satisfy. That's pretty clear, right? You can write 5 in front of this equation. So it's, it's not a unique answer. Um, and and I'll, I'll explain that. And I'll, when I go through MATLAB, I'll explain how MATLAB makes it unique. But I won't cover that now. All right. So let's say you have these three cases, which is the ones we're going to do. Okay. The first one is the eigenvalues are distinct. Okay, I should have said they're real too, but I'll fix that. So they're real and they're distinct. That they'll produce linearly independent eigenvectors. So you understand, once you once you've have computed these eigenvectors for each eigenvalue, now you, can put, you could put them in a big matrix. Okay, so this is a, a famous matrix that we'll use at the end of the lecture. But, you know, you can make a matrix capital X and each column of this matrix could be one of your eigenvalues, or eigenvectors, sorry. Right, you understand an eigenvector is an n-dimensional column vector, okay? So I can take all these eigenvectors and I can put all, all these columns and I can form an n by n matrix called X, okay? That matrix is called the modal matrix, we'll talk about it, and it's very important for the last part of what we're going to do today. But in order to use it properly, these, this, has to, this matrix has to be invertible, which means all these columns have to be linearly independent to, to do what we want to do. So that's why we're interested in that. Um, and so if the, if the eigenvalues are real and distinct, they will be linearly independent by definition. You don't have to worry about it. Okay? Um, if they're repeated, if the eigenvalues are repeated, then generally speaking, they won't be linearly independent. And there's ways to get around this, but we don't have we don't have the time to do everything that we'd like to do, so I'm not going to try to do the last part of the lecture for this particular case, for example. Okay? Um, and if you have complex eigenvalues, then it ends up that the eigenvectors, which I'll show you, are also complex, and the procedure is a little bit tedious, but I'll, I'll show you how to do it. Okay? So the main point of this slide here is once you have your eigenvalues in hand, you've computed them, then for each eigenvalue, you're going to plug it in this equation, you know, lambda 1, and try to find a vector x1. That vector x1 is the first eigenvector, and you'll have to do this for each eigenvalue. Okay. Without further ado, as they say. Ah, we'll finally do one. Okay. So here is, I, I, I do two by two problems because they're simple and easy to understand. Um, and you can do them all analytically, as, as I'm about to explain. So let's say you have this matrix A here. So I give this matrix A. You see it? It's 1, 2, 3, minus 4. And I say compute the um, eigenvector, eigenvalues and eigenvectors for that. So first thing we're going to do is compute the eigenvalues. So I'm going to take the matrix A, I'm going to subtract off lambda i. You can also do lambda i minus A. It doesn't make any difference. Either one's fine. So I d sometimes you might see notes and I'll do lambda i minus A. But do it's the same. Okay? So you got your A, you've got your lambda i there. So you subtract lambda i from a just means you subtract lambda off the diagonals of the elements right here. Okay. So all I've done is subtract lambda on these diagonal elements. 
<coughs> then I need, <coughs> need to take the determinant of that guy, which I'm doing right here. And hopefully remember the formula. You can always look it up if you don't. For a determinant of a two by two matrix, is it has two terms. It's this thing times this. And then I subtract these two elements multiplied together. And that's what I'm showing here. Those are the two diagonal elements multiplied together minus the two off diagonal multiplied together. All right? <coughs> and um, obviously there's a little bit of algebra to do, which I usually skip because, you know, it's, it's not at all exciting. But if you were to write out, to compute this and simplify it, you'd get this polynomial, right? So it's a second order polynomial because the original matrix was two by two. If the original matrix was three by three, it'd be a third order polynomial, so on and so forth, okay? So obviously I've constructed this problem carefully to get nice answers. And this is typical of what I do if you, well, it's not so easy in stats, but <coughs> like if I give a problem on exam, I try to give you this kind of problem. Why? Because it's, it's, it's easy to factor and it's got, the, the factors are actually integers to make it nice. So. This, if you factor that guy, that's right. Uh, that's not right. <coughs> Sorry. Right, so that's lambda squared plus 3 lambda minus 10. Is that what I had? Yes. I, li I like that. Okay. So. You understand, I, I actually started with this and worked backwards. But so, okay, so there it is. You can factor it. If you, if you don't see that's the roots, you can plug it in to the quadratic equation and get the roots. But there's two lambdas. One of them is minus 5, right? That makes this term 0, and, my, and plus 2 makes that term 0. And I called minus 5 lambda 1 and, la and 2 lambda 2. There's no, order doesn't make any difference. Call them whatever order you want. Okay? But when I when I give them this order, I'm going to find two eigenvectors, x1 and x2, and then the order of the eigenvectors matter relative to the order of the eigenvalues. So there'll be an x1 that matches this lambda 1 and x2 that matches that. Okay, so that's pretty simple, certainly for this case. You can appreciate, I hope, that if this matrix is large and complex, then this may not be all that pleasant, right? Because you have to take the determinant of it first, which is hard to do for us if it's high dimensional. And then you get a high order polynomial, which you have to find the roots of, and that's not so easy either. But obviously in MATLAB, you can do a problem of arbitrary complexity in an arbitrarily short period of time. I'll show you that. Okay. So now you have to find the eigenvector for this problem, or eigenvectors. There's going to be two of them. And so there's my matrix A, <coughs> and there's my two eigenvalues, lambda 1 and lambda 2. And so all I've done here is I've written out this equation So I'm just writing out, um, <laughs> what is that? It's not, sorry. And now I've left myself no space. So far so good, I'd say. All right, I'm just going to write out this problem, you know, AX equal lambda X, where the A matrix is 1, 2, Three minus four. So all I've done in that, um, which I'll have to point here, right here, is I've just written the scalar version of those equations, right? So I have x1 plus 2x2 equal lambda x1. And then 3x1 minus 4x2 equal lambda x2. So I've just written out the scalar version of those equations. And then in the second part, I've just brought the lambdas, the terms involving lambda, onto the left-hand side of the equation and generate those two equations, okay? Now, what we're going to find here, so you might think, um, whoa, this is good. I've got two equations and two unknowns, right? So you remember I told you to do, if you want to find the, the vector, the first eigenvector, you're going to plug in the first eigenvalue, like lambda equal minus 5, right here. And then you're going to get two equations and two unknowns, but you're about to learn you're only going to get one equation because they're always linearly dependent, okay, by construction. <coughs> so let's do that. So here's the equation I get just by bringing these onto the left-hand side. And now I'm going to plug in, for this case, lambda 1 equal minus 5 into this equation, and I generate this equation here, right? I mean, I get 1 plus 5, so that's where I get that. 
So I get that equation, and then over here, you get what? Minus one, but it becomes a plus, and get those two equations. Those are the same equation, right? Because the, the, first, the, the first equation is just the second equation times two, right? So if I take the second equation, multiply it by two, I just get the first equation back. So that's what I mean, they're not unique, right? So you're going to pick x1, and then you can solve it for x2. Or you can pick x2 and solve it for x1. I like, I like nice numbers, right? So I picked x1 equal 1, and that gave me x2 equals minus 3. Now, right, but there's no, there, this is not unique is what I'm saying. You can multiply this thing times any constant, and it's still a legitimate eigenvector. So you might come up with different ones, but that's what I came up with. <coughs> and then you can do the same thing for the second eigenvalue, which is 2. So I plug 2 in right there and 2 in right there. And if I do that, I get these two equations. You'll see again, they're linearly dependent. So the second equation is equal, I've lost my pointer. Second equation is the first equation times minus 3. So again, just there's one equation. So in this case, I pick x2 to be 1, and I compute that x1 is 2. But again, you can pick anything you want. But I mean, why would you pick x1 to be like 0 0.37542? You could. It would be stupid, but you could do it. Okay, it would still be right, but I would still mock you probably for, for a choice that makes no sense. But it's not incorrect. All right? Now it ends up that MATLAB, so do you understand this would be a problem for something like MATLAB, because when you... If you were to call MATLAB to find an eigenvector, you'd like the same answer every time, right? You wouldn't feel good if you hit return every time it gave you a different answer. They're all right, but all different, right? So MATLAB imposes the additional restriction, which isn't necessary, but it's good for a computational tool, that if you find an eigenvector like x, the, the norm of that thing has to be equal to 1. You see, if you impose the additional constraint, it has to satisfy the equation and the norm of the vector has to be 1, then it gives you something unique. So when you use MATLAB, you'll find, indeed, it comes up with some pretty weird numbers. <coughs> like, it'll give you something where the norm of this vector is 1, and, and this element will be, you know, I should say this second element will be minus 3 times the first element, but they'll be weird-looking numbers. But the, if you were to take the norm of this thing in MATLAB, you find it has a norm of 1. So we're not going to worry about that. Any eigenvector is okay, but you'll notice when we do MATLAB, it makes it unique in that way. Okay? So you understand what we got here now is we've got... There's the first eigenvalue, and there's its corresponding eigenvector, and there's the second eigenvalue and corresponding eigenvector. Okay? So, that's, that's cool, I guess. We still haven't really talked about why these eigenvalues and eigenvectors are all that useful, but I, t I told you at the beginning of solving differential equations, which we'll come back to. All right. So there's the simplest case. Here's another case. Okay? So it's, it's not too much more complex, but it's different. So we have a new matrix A. So we're going to again form A minus lambda I. It just consists of subtracting lambda off the diagonal, right? And obviously if we take the determinant of that matrix because it's triangular, it's just going to be these two elements multiplied together, right? Because this times this is zero. So it's just two, mi two minus lambda squared. That has two roots, lambda two and lambda two. So it's second order, but the, the root's the same. It's repeated. It's real repeated root, two. Okay? All right. So nothing unique or interesting so far, but as we're about to find, that does raise some problems with, co with finding the corresponding eigenvectors, um, which we're about to do. Okay. So we'll do the same thing that I did last time. So first of all, there's your matrix A. And there's the two eigenvalues. So I'm going to write out the two, right? I'm going to write out this equation again in scalar.